at a leader's, well, in the leader's thing here last night, when I was introducing her last night, I was thinking, how many years have we known each other? And it's got to be 20 or 30 years, and that we all uh, lived in Taranaki and that, because they passed to the church in that region, and so did we in Palmerston North, which is just out of Taranaki, but we used to get together for uh, pastors' things and that kind of thing. But um, we've done lots of things over t uh, years together, run women's conferences, events and things like that um, for the region of Taranaki, etc. in the southern North Island. And um, so we've done quite a bit of work together, but um, we're good friends as well. And that, that we've known, like, you, sort of when you know people for so long, you grow together, you see the kids grow up, you uh, talk about the grandchildren that arrive and that kind of thing. So she's a precious friend in that, but she's a great lady in ministry as well and that, and she's got a real heart for prayer, heart for woman, uh, prophetic heart as well inside her, and she's a really good lady in that. Uh, but before she comes to speak, I'm going to ask Rowling if she would like to come up and open in prayer for us. We haven't got any music today, so just asked a couple of ladies if they can come and pray and start our sessions off for us. So thank you, Rowling. <coughs> Father, we, we come together as women and um, Father, we're here for one purpose and that is we love you and our hearts are open to you. Father, we, we come with expectant hearts and um, yeah, just thank you for each and every beautiful woman who's here today. God, I know you have something special for each and every one of us. Father, that you will speak directly to our hearts because everybody is so unique and your intention is to grow us and um, encourage us and love us and bless us. And I pray that each and every person here will feel your presence, will be touched by you in a very special way. Father, thank you for Pip. Thank you for giving up, that she's given up her time to come. And Lord, I pray that you will bless her and anoint her and that she will just be full of you. As, as she comes and just shares what it is that you want her to, to share today. What we do, we worship you. And we are so, so blessed. Lord, just th this beautiful day you've given us. Yeah, thank you, God, that we know you. And we know that this time will just grow us closer to you. And that's what we're here for, Father, to, <clears throat> to grow, to get to know you more. Yeah, so thank you. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Riley. So let's give Pip a hand as she comes this morning now. Very good. Fantastic. Well, good morning, ladies. I'm impressed that you're all here, sort of bright eyed and bushy tailed and ready for a day together. And uh, thank you so much, Ruth. I am very honoured at the invitation. I never take the opportunity of being asked to come somewhere lightly. I just thank God, how amazing that you're asking me. <laughs> how amazing you are, God, what you do with us. And uh, so I appreciate the prayers and I appreciate the fact that you've come because if we didn't have you here, you know, life is so much better when we do it together. And so I'm expectant that the Holy Spirit's going to um, speak to us today, encourage you today. Maybe he might challenge you. I don't know. But uh, the theme that we've got is about seasons and about harvest in particular. And I picked up the wrong ones, not wrong notes. Let's try these ones first. And Ruth asked me... Um, even as I'm speaking, maybe to weave a little bit of my story into what I'm sharing today, just so that you maybe have an idea of where I'm coming from and maybe something somewhere you might relate with or you might think, thank God that wasn't me, you know, and you, you can just be grateful that God didn't take that, that situation. It hasn't been part of your life. So I'm going to talk this morning about the sowing years. <clears throat> I heard a message years ago, I went to a youth conference when our kids were teenagers and there was a speaker there called Greg Johnson and he sp spoke about the three seasons of a person's life and he talked about the sowing years, the growing years and the reaping years. And uh, he talked about where Jesus as a child in Luke 2, he, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and man. So we all start with the growing years. 
And then we come to a place which is called the sowing years. When Jesus was at 12 years of age, he went to the temple and he astounded the priests there with his interaction because Jesus was growing. But he, he right even from that moment, he found himself in the temple and it was be the beginning of us understanding his sowing years. Where did he start sowing, first of all, but in the house of God and in the purposes of God? So you might be, we, we all are, I'm looking around this room, no doubt about it, we're all past the initial growing years, except, you know, sometimes we're going this way and we don't want to grow that way. But um, one of the things that I've discovered is that we reap for a whole lot longer than we sow. Full-grown trees of seeds that we've sown continue to produce fruit for a long time. So we might have had a seed of something that we've planted and we just think, well, you know, it, it isn't just one year. We expect it to produce fruit. We expect it to produce fruit every year from then on in until the tree dies, don't we? And uh, sometimes we might discover that we are reaping fruit from seeds that we've sown and we're not happy with the fruit we're reaping. <laughs> And so that's why, you know, mums of teenagers and mums with young people and, and grandmas that have got influence in their teenagers' lives, can I encourage you with this, this concept that you can teach your kids what you sow now, you will reap for a long time. What you are putting into your life now, you will reap for a very long time. Except for the grace of God sometimes. So it matters the seeds we sow, ladies. Uh, if you want to be a sweet little old lady, then being a, be a sweet young person now. It won't just happen automatically unless we're sowing the seeds of it. And if you're a grumpy old lady now, then ask God to sow some seeds of sweetness into you right now because it's never too late to start changing. <laughs> no, nobody's looking at each other here. I know I can see that. It's all right. If you want to sh freely share the word of God then you need to sow the word of God into your heart. If you want to have God's solutions for situations that you're in, then it has to come by putting it in you to start with. It's got to be there in your spirit for the spirit of God to remind you at a time that you need it. And so there is never, it's never wasted when you're sowing the seed of the word of God into our hearts and into our lives. If you want people to trust and respect you, then don't sow seeds of gossip. Don't betray confidences. You know, you, you wonder why somebody doesn't want to be your friend, but actually what kind of a friend have you been previously? And if somebody has shared something close and you've discovered the whole community knows about it, then surprise, surprise. If you want to sow friendship, then be the good friend. If you're not, I was going to say if you're not young, if you are young and not married and you're working, I don't know if anybody's in that category here right now. Is anybody in this situation? I want to say to you, you're the, at the freest and the richest stage of your life. <laughs> Use this time to sow generously. You know, when we're in that season, who, who knows that before you had other responsibilities, you could choose what you did with your money. From then on in, it's your kids that need the money. It's your grandkids that needs your money. It's everything else, you know. And so you never have the right to make the decision for your own money anymore. It's always got a, there's always a weight somewhere that's saying, I need this, you know. Mum, I've got this school trip to go to. Mum, I've got this. I need that. I need these clothes. I need whatever. You know, I need, I need, I need. And then you have the grandchildren doing the same thing to you. It's just like, you know. I'll just tell you a little bit about where I'm at. I've got four grown children. And my oldest is 40. Can't believe that. And my youngest is 32. And so I had four children under seven. So I've got a boy, a girl, a boy and a girl. And uh, so we, we, after a long time of 10 years of having no children in the same city as us, in the last uh, seven years, we now have two of our kids and their families. With us, we've got seven grandchildren. And our oldest grandson has just turned eight, and our youngest is just one. And so we have two in New Plymouth, our oldest son and our youngest daughter. And we have a son in London, and he's married an English girl. And we have a little English grandson called Luke, and he's mm, one and a half. 
and we're going over to see him in November, which is very exciting. So I'm looking forward to that. And we have a daughter who's in Taupo, and she's got two little kitties there. And so we've, this is, that's where our world is at right now. And uh, our youngest daughter and her husband are actually on staff with us. Our, um, our son-in-law is our associate pastor, and our daughter works as an office administrator in the church. And so we, except for our, one of our sons, all our kids are loving God and going on for God at the moment. And our, our one son that isn't, I call him my Jonah, and it's not necessarily that he's... Um, denying God. I think he's just running away from the call of God on his life right now because we know he's got a call of God on his life. And, and I just say there's a big fish swimming around the UK just waiting for the moment that he's going to be. <laughs> and, you know, we're very grateful that we've, we've got um, lovely, our kids have married great spouses and we feel incredibly blessed by that. And one of the things that in today's world, which just seems like a miracle to me, that each of their, the ones that they've married They've come from families whose mums and dads are still together. So I just, I just, I thank God for the heritage for my grandchildren because they're, they're being raised with the fact that family can survive. <laughs> and family is, um, you know, so we, we love our grandkids. My, my, my husband Steve is the senior pastor at City West Church in New Plymouth and we've been there for 18 years. And uh, before that we were pastoring in, uh, a small town called Hawara, which is an hour south of New Plymouth, around the mountain, and uh, that's what you know, you laugh about that in Taranaki because people, when they, when you ask them if they've lived anywhere else, they've lived somewhere else around the mountain. <laughs> they don't, don't very often live away from or have moved away. It's that's a hilarious thing. Except that um, Julie, Julie, Julie's moved down here, big, big step across the ocean. <laughs> And so we've, we've been in ministry probably, um, well, 13 and 18, add that together, mathematician, a wee while. And I only actually got my credentials myself about eight years ago, not because I wasn't functioning in the role, but probably it was, you know, I just thought, did I need a label to be doing what I was doing? And then one day God said, you do, you need the label. And uh, so I went and um, worked towards my credentials. So our, our life is, that's, that's where we are now. But I tell you, that's not necessarily where we started. That's not necessarily what life looked like at the beginning. And uh, I have journeyed through all sorts of seasons in my life to get where I am today. And some of them have been great and some of them have not been. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the seasons that I've journeyed, just so that you can get a picture maybe of who I am and maybe what God can do in the midst of what you think is like too hard to cope with. And so one of the things that um, I became a Christian when I was 17, I had my, my parents were actually Presbyterian minist, um, missionaries, so I was actually born in Vanuatu and lived there till I was seven and I was an only child until my um, parents adopted my one brother when I was 11 years old. And so we came back to New Zealand when I was seven and we, um, because they wanted to medically find out if there was a reason why they couldn't have any more children, because I had, they had given birth to me and then hadn't been able to conceive again. So anyway, that, they, we came back to New Zealand and they couldn't conceive, so then began the process of adopting my brother when I was 11. And so my my mum um, would say that she was expecting but not pregnant for six months because we knew that there was a woman through the Presbyterian support system that had linked us with a, um, a mum who was expecting a baby and knew that she wasn't going to be able to raise this child. And so we were linked together and and so we, we were expectant of this baby coming. And we lived in Picton at that time. We used to live in Picton. My dad was a teacher in Picton. And so he taught at Picton Borough Primary School. And in um, that year, it was the next year, 1968, my brother was born in Wellington Hospital. So mum and I together had the empty pram, went across on the ferry with this empty pram and everything in it for a baby, and went to Wellington Hospital to pick up our newborn 
for our family and then came back with this wee, beautiful wee boy. So part of that season, you know, you go from being an only child to becoming sharing life with a baby. <laughs> it, was a, it was a bit of a challenge for me at the time, but I loved it and I, you know, I thrived in it and I became like a mother to this little one and, and loved that season. And so all this time, you know, while all my growing up years, I went to church every Sunday. There was never a choice about that. Church was part of what our life was. But to be fair, I don't think, and I even got confirmed within the Presbyterian Church, and I, you know, I'm so grateful for my Presbyterian heritage in some ways because I, I was raised alongside other missionary women and men. So, you know, I just think I didn't get raised alongside my um, flesh family, you know, my aunties and uncles, but I, I am so grateful for the ones that I've called uncle and auntie in the ministry because they've helped form who I am. And uh, But through the process, I never actually realized I had to give Jesus Christ my, my life. You know, I knew about God. I knew about the God stories. I read about, you know, I knew about Jesus. But to actually have a personal relationship with myself, I didn't know that you could do that. And I was hungry for that. And I can remember reading the Bible and thinking, trying, trying to make sense of what this life was about. And it made no I can remember reading the parable where Jesus was talking about, you know, the plank in somebody else, the plank in your own eye and the speck in somebody else's. And I, I'm thinking, what the heck is that talking about? I just had no idea. I thought, this makes no sense to me. Anyway, when I was 17, a girlfriend invited me to a camp run by the Anglican Church on Waiheke Island. And she helped me be a cook in the kitchen, which I think is hilarious because cooking was not one of my skills. So, you know, I said, well, I'll help you if you tell me what to do, but it's nothing that I can do very well at all. <coughs> And in that environment, that 10-day environment of working in this place and watching um, people my own age with a relationship with Jesus touched me because they had a joy about them. They were having fun and they weren't on drugs and they weren't getting drunk and they weren't, you know, doing what my high school peers were all doing at the time. And, I, you know, in my confused state, I was joining them in that place, but that still wasn't satisfying and it was just messy. And so at that camp, I um, had a discussion with one of the leaders and said, how, you know, I, I've seen that these guys have something. I, I want what they've got. And so the, the leader said to me, well, you can have it, Pip. You need to ask Jesus into your life. Ask him to forgive you of your sin. And you can have what they've got. And I can remember saying to her, but what say I ask and nothing happens? And she said, I've never known him to let anybody down yet. And so I went away, We'd, I didn't pray the prayer right then, I went away and I can remember sitting on a rock in Palm Beach in Waiheke Island saying, okay, if what she said is true, and God, if you really are there, then I want you to come into my life. Nothing spectacular happened, you know, the birds didn't all just start singing, and the, you know, there was, there was no kind of momentous stars in the sky experience, it was just I walked away from the rock having had that little discussion with this God who I hoped was there, who I hoped was listening. And uh, the next two weeks that followed were this incredible revelation of God actually starting to do things in my life. I was in a transition pace between um, starting leaving high school at the end of my high school years, my seventh form year, and starting Teachers College in Palmerston North. And in that season and in that place in Palmerston North, um, I was really worried that I wasn't going to be able to continue being a Christian because I just made that commitment and I, you know, I didn't know anybody in Palmerston North. I had no friends there. All my friends, because I lived in Mike and I then, were going to be going to Wellington Teachers College because we were zoned back in that day in the education system. There were zoned areas and Mike and I was Wellington zone and I went to Palmerston North. But it was the grace of God leading me to Palmerston North and I ended up in this two weeks after this camp, I discovered I was boarding with this lady. And this lady took five girls every year from either Massey or Teachers College. And the very first girl that I met in this place where I was boarding for this first year was a born-again, on-fire Anglican girl. whose name was Jenny. And 
she nurtured me in that first year of being a Christian. And I just think, oh my goodness, God, how did you do that? And uh, there were just situation after situation after situation that I couldn't deny that God was at work in that place. And through Jenny and I and my, you know, we, we worked together with, there were two other girls in the place, got saved that year. And then a third friend got saved and we all went flatting the following year together. And, uh, and through, through that process, I went to, with Jenny, because she was already spirit filled, I went with her to what they called Life in the Spirit seminars at Massey University. We biked out there every week for six to eight weeks across Palmerston North, right across in the middle of, you know, in winter biking, took me 45 minutes from our flat on Margaret Street to the other side of Massey University. But we were hungry for God and God baptized me in the Holy Spirit. And that was just a dynamic that I thought, oh my goodness, you know, I had, I, I had read about Jesus and I knew about Jesus, but all of a sudden it felt like he was my friend and I could know him. I think that if you have never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, can I encourage you, be prayed for that, because it just brings another dimension of his presence into your life. And so my, that season was a wonderful season. I loved my years at Teachers College. I loved those years. And then in the, towards the end of, um, at the end of our second year, I met Steve. Well, actually one of the girls in my flat was going out with one of the girls in his flat. One of the boys, sorry. Good to qualify that one. Good to qualify that one, especially today. Anyway, so, uh, and Steve had asked me to go out with him. And I said, no, thank you. Actually, I didn't answer him at all for a wee while. He, my husband is six foot two. And I, I, was quite rude to him until his flatmate came and said to me, you at least better answer him, for goodness sake, have some polite manners, you know. And because I just really, I had just come through a relationship that had broken up and I just wasn't interested in boys or men. I just thought they were way too complicated to add to your life and I just wasn't interested. Anyway, Steve was very persistent. So he asked again if he could take me out. He had an English assignment that... Um, he wanted to fulfill him, uh, he had to go to a play, so he'd invited me to go to this play with him. Finally, I said, yes, I would, after persistence and pushing, which, um, and then we started going out for about a fortnight, until the, I just thought, no, actually, I don't want to go out with anybody, I don't want to go out with you, so I just said to him that particular Friday, sorry, Steve, I'm just not interested in going out, well, he wasn't happy, he was not happy at all. And we had um, that, we used to have it when I was at Teachers College, we had these Friday night teas with the Christian Fellowship. And we, had, we were hosting one of those in our flat. And so Steve came that night, not very happy. So I ended up talking to him to try and pacify his anger, saying, I just don't, I'm not interested. And so we decided we would go and talk about it. And in the midst of talking about this, I hear this voice speak to me in a very firm, very quiet way, Pip, change your mind. Pip, change your mind. And I'm thinking, oh, really? <laughs> really? God, really? Because I, you know, I, I, I recognize it, his voice, and I, I'm thinking, this, that's quite a, um, you know, an intense responsibility if I change my mind because you obviously got a, have got something more in this than what I think because I'm, I'm not here to muck around with this. I don't want to but anyway, upshot was I recognized that actually this was more serious in its consequence and it, you know, praise God for it now but at the time I, I thought, so I squeaked this little okay, I changed my mind <laughs> trying to convince myself that I was happy with this <laughs> and it was just a gift from God. So that, that process of change and me becoming in relationship with Steve was great. Except that we then ended up becoming pregnant before we were married. And so we were, we'd, we'd got engaged 
about um, six months after, you know, that little squeaky voice that said, okay, I changed my mind. Because I, you know, I knew instantly that that, without knowing in fullness, but I just knew that this was a permanent arrangement. <laughs> and, um, and then we had this season where for me the world fell upside down. And I, you know, like I've shared, I'm my, my parents' only daughter. And so when you go to your parents and you have to say to them, Mum, I think I'm pregnant. And it's not, it wasn't the picture I wanted for my parents. It wasn't the picture I wanted for myself. It wasn't, I felt ashamed. I felt such huge regret. I felt disappointment. And uh, that was the beginning of a journey that was a hard one for a few years. And when I went to my parents, I am so grateful that they just loved me. I, you know, I'm grateful that it, it could have been worse because, you know, some situations, parents kick the child out of the house and say, you know, you brought shame to us. We don't want anything to do with you anymore. But uh, my mum and dad were so... Um, loving in that regard and they 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 said okay well we'll bring the wedding forward so instead of the wedding being in January the wedding came forward to October and so we got married in labor weekend and I wore a pink dress with a bump and just stood in that place probably just a bit stunned mullet still really because you know my life was had just changed completely so quickly but I was so grateful for my husband because in that in that wedding place he, he just um, stood and apologized on behalf of both of us to all our family and guests for where we were at and what had happened and he said we are so sorry before you that this is what's happened this is not what we'd planned this is not what we desired and we recognize that you have loved us and supported us to where we are today. And we've, we've not made the good start, but we will do our best to build from here. And so that was a, you know, like a, I, I can remember looking at Steve thinking, oh my goodness, look at you. <laughs> Absolutely, profoundly grateful for this in integrous man in the midst of our mess. Um, but that was not the only thing that happened. The, the week that I found out I was pregnant, which um, was traumatic enough, you would think, was within two, two days or a week, my, my girlfriend, my flatmate Marg, her brother was flatting, had been flatting with Steve, and he was 17. He'd come over from Waipukarao, and he, was, um, he loved uh, bike racing, not motorbike racing, but bike racing. He was training for a bike race, and a car went through an intersection and killed him. And so he um, died in the midst of that. In that same two-week period, I had been teaching, doing a, a section at Fielding in a Fielding primary school for six weeks, and I'd been in the new entrance class and uh, loved that season. And, and with the teacher, had because um, the teacher had such a passion for all her kids, and one of the little boys in the class his mum um, was parenting on her own and she had two wee kiddies and she wanted to do everything she could to help her little boy with his reading so I'd gone with the teacher after school one day to this home to take some books and for the teacher to help the mum know what to do to help her little boy with his reading within this two-week period that I found out I was pregnant this little boy was run over by a train at the, on the right close to where his um, home was so as you can partially imagine, this was such a huge season of grief and shock and sadness that in every respect, it seemed my world had turned upside down. And I can remember telling my teacher's college lecturer, one of them, that I was expecting a baby. He said, oh, so you'll be another one of those barefoot and pregnant women pushing a pram around Woolworths, will you? So, you know, it's like you, you just think everything in my world imploded. I can remember actually in the midst of this, you know, trying to plan a wedding, trying to talk about those kind of things. And I can remember we had a phone on the wall in the hall of our home. I was staying down with mum and dad as we were doing some of the plans for it. 
and there were so many decisions and I can remember just kind of curling up in this fetal position on the floor down by the phone talking to Steve saying I've got no idea what to do I can't make a decision I I just don't know what to do but God who can take a person from that place to here and I, I, I look back on that time and I just thank God for it I thank God for that season I thank God for everything I learned in that season I thank God for what he taught me there was one scripture that God gave to me out of Romans in that that time it says for to those who love God who were called in his plan all things work together for good and so you know I would come back and say well God I know I love you I feel like I've failed you hugely I was helping with a youth group at that time in Palmerston North and um, and I when I went and spoke to the older lady who was in charge of the youth group she tapped me on the forehead like this you silly silly girl and I thought that doesn't help me <laughs> yep I know I'm living with the silliness believe me <laughs> and uh, we you know I realized I didn't need to be told what my failures were I, I had them in my face you know can I encourage you when you're dealing with ones who have failed when you're dealing with ones who've made mistakes when you're dealing with ones who've ended up you know discovering oh that was a dumb move don't tell don't tell them it was a dumb move they know it was dumb all they need to know is that there's hope in it that somewhere there's hope that comes to the other side of this so I don't I don't know what you girls have done in your life you have maybe done some dumb stuff and I'm not here to tell you that what the stuff you've done is dumb I'm, I'm here to tell you that there's hope on the other side of that when you give that to Jesus and you ask him and you say God I love you and if I love you and I know you've called me to be your child I'm your daughter it's a good thing about God his love is so hugely encompassing that he does not stop loving you even when you make dumb mistakes and you know as parents we, we kind of understand that a little bit with our children although sometimes we we struggle to love them when they do really dumb things <laughs> but we know something's drawn in there and we say God you know you love them I can remember my kids going through their teenage years and especially when the boys are teenagers that's just I I found them really quite difficult to love in their teenage boy years you know they're just you know pastor Kim Price used to say that they've got a bolt missing until they're about 25 there's a bolt missing in them somewhere <laughs> <laughs> and so God gave me a strategy I went back and I looked through all their little photos of when they were preschoolers and toddlers and I said oh you're so cute oh I do love you that's right I do love you <laughs> <laughs> But you see the thing is when we make mistakes we need to know that God who loves us has a way out sometimes we we actually live with the consequence like I, I still have an oldest son who was born you know like he was conceived out of wedlock did God take the pregnancy away when I asked him to forgive me for doing the wrong thing no he didn't and so I you know praise God he's a great son and I love him but I I tell you there were through the process because you know in essence he was a child born in rebellion because I was in a rebellious state and my response to God and how God you know I knew God didn't want that but I did it anyway <laughs> what's that called rebellion <laughs> and so sometimes when raising him I could see rebelliousness in his nature and in his character which was a seed I had sown in his life and so it was only out of the grace of God and the forgiveness of God and the love of God that God gave in my heart from that was able to nurture him out of that place and say God he's a gift to me and I so am so grateful for his life and I'm so grateful God that you can turn around for to those who love God who are called in this plan all things work together for good what time's morning tea Ruth quarter past so I, I had to come through that season of grief and of shame and one of the things about the shame in that season for me and I don't know whether maybe you've ever encountered that for yourself too but because I had made this big mistake I thought God could never use me again I thought I had let God down 
I thought that I was no longer trustworthy to God. I thought that he never could um, entrust any responsibility to me again. And so I was really disappointed with myself with that. And so I never could see myself in a leadership position. I never wanted to be in a leadership position because I, I just thought I wasn't trustworthy. I thought, God, I failed you. That test has passed and been and gone and I'm no longer able to be used by you. And so I would serve my husband and, and do the things behind the scenes and, you know, but I, I never ever put my head above because I thought I'm not worthy to be there. So I just did what needed to be done in the background. Then um, there was a another season of where, because the enemy is so out to rob and steal from you what your future is. <laughs> he hates what your future is in God and he will do everything he can to um, annihilate what that plan is, whether he comes to you from outward circumstances or whether he comes to you from inward circumstances. And I, I spoke to the girls last night at the leadership um, night about a season of fear and bondage that I was in when we lived in Carterton. And I had this season of fear, which came externally. We had a, a young man up the street that we discovered who was ringing whenever Steve left the house and he would say disgusting things on the phone. And this, did, this happened for about six to eight months until we finally discovered who it was. So every time the phone rang, I became paralyzed with fear absolutely shut down in every way and so you know Steve would come home from teaching at school and you know I would I would not even be dressed you know there would be change dirty nappies on the I just couldn't move I just I didn't couldn't function it was just this paralyzing bondage of fear and fear is not a good friend <laughs> and uh, so God set me free from that in a process where one of one of the ladies at the time rang me up one day and said Pip I feel that this God has given me this scripture for you. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and a sound mind. So then I had to retrain my brain and my response, my fear response to align with God's word. And whenever fear would come, I'd say, this is not from God. So I don't need to accept fear. God, you've not given to me a spirit of fear, but you've given me love. You've given me power. I'm not a victim in this. And you've given me a sound mind. I'm not going crazy. I'm not going to be crazy. This is, you know, and once we left Carterton, and in fact, in that stage, after, after we, Steve and I got married, Steve wasn't baptized in the Holy Spirit, and he carried shame and rejection through the whole process as well too, but men carry it in a different way to women, and so when we came to Carterton, we shifted from Palmerston North, we had one year there, married with our and that's where our little son was born and then we shifted to the wider wrapper because steve got a job we you were allocated jobs in those days you couldn't choose you you were um directed because he had to finish our bond so in that place steve in his shame stopped going to church stopped um he just didn't think he was good enough for church and, and the church was an interesting place anyway but because I, I had this in my heart that I loved God and I was called by God and I would go and I would go along and uh, but I was desperate for Steve to be alongside me because you know I just thought that's what I wanted more than anything else and he'd say no no you're the spiritual one you go I'll stay home and look after the kids and it was a real place of kind of isolation for me because we went um there was in the church that I went to and there was only one church or there were two churches no, maybe three Catholic Anglican and Presbyterian and because I would had a Presbyterian background that's what I went to that's all I knew and it was a place where everybody in the room was white-haired there were no young families in that church and you know I had at that stage um I was expecting a baby and I had Andrew and so I used to go with my handbag filled with food <laughs> and books and quiet toys and he, I would never put shoes on him because it was a wooden floor so he had slippers on so that if he ended up getting off my seat there would be, there would be not the clank 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 you know I was everything I did I and it was just like this um <laughs> this place 
And I was praying and praying and praying. And the, 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 see, in every season, even if it's hard, God has a jewel there for you to find. In every dark place, God has something rich of his love for you in that place to find. And I had read a book in that place and in that time called What Happens When Women Pray by Evelyn Christensen. I don't know whether anybody's ever read that book. And so it, was, it had not long been out. So I would, I'd read this book and she talks about in that book about having a prayer partner. And, and I thought, oh, who on earth could I have as a prayer partner? You know, like in this place, Jesus. It's like, anyway, I go to church the very next Sunday and I get talking to this lovely little lady called Mrs. Brown. Now, I was 21. Mrs. Brown had, um, she was probably 70. And she was, her and her husband had retired from Lower Hutt up to Carterton. And as I was talking to Mrs. Brown, she said, I just read this book called What Happens When We Won't Pray. I said, really? I've just read that book. And she said, and I was just thinking about, they talk about having a prayer partner. I said, just what I was thinking. She said, well, why don't we get together every week and pray? Why don't we be prayer partners? So the hilarious thing was that she would beetle out in her little old Austin to where I lived out in the country and I would put my little babies to bed for an hour and we would pray together. This little 70-year-old Mrs. Brown and me. <laughs> and one day, after a few weeks we'd been getting together, she would say to me, Philippa, because she called me Philippa, Philippa, I, you know, I read the Bible and it said if you open your mouth and you ask God to fill it with his words, he will. She said, I did that and he did it. <laughs> I said, really? She said, do you do that? I said, well, actually I do. And so we would start speaking in tongues. She said, why don't we do a little bit of that every week when we start? <laughs> so every week we would, she would come with a scripture and then we would do a little bit of that. <laughs> and then we would pray for the things that were on our heart. And we, I would pray with Mrs. Brown for Steve and ask God that God would touch this man's life. So about two years later, he started getting together with another um, older man in the church. And he'd been invited to a men's breakfast by the, um, what's the men's kind of full gospel men's businessmen. Yeah, so they had a breakfast and he went along to this and Steve was completely challenged. And uh, so he started doing a Bible study with this friend of ours. And I was really excited about that. I'm thinking, yay, God, at last, this is awesome. And then we knew that his tenure for teaching in Carterton was over. And, and I was adamant that he would have to stay in Carterton because God was linking him up with this man and his, he was getting his relationship with God back and you know anything that you know God would do differently he would be kiboshing the whole it would be the enemy so Steve applied for 18 jobs over that next few months to try and get a job teaching in the wider wrapper and there was nothing absolutely zip reply and so he finally th said to me he said well I've got to I've got to apply elsewhere I said no 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 God I'm sure God wants us to stay in Carterton I'm positive I'm the spiritual one remember <laughs> anyway we didn't get a job in Carterton we got a job at Hawara and uh, I was heartbroken devastated and so within six weeks we had shifted from Carterton to Hawara and we moved into a, another season for me. And we moved into a schoolhouse in a little tiny community, community called Okiawa, which was about 20 minutes drive from the house to the school where Steve was teaching, completely in a farming environment, completely. There was a, so he didn't teach at the Okiawa school, he was teaching in, in the Hawara Intermediate. And we had one car again, so I had this isolated season of despair because I thought we'd made a big mistake. I thought we'd made this, Steve had made this big mistake with our lives. He'd got it wrong. <laughs> I knew. <laughs> and so in the midst of being stuck at Okiawa, and you know, I, I can remember taking um, Andrew and Debbie to the, like they had a little play center thing in this little community. There was a pub, there was a school, there was a corner store and a garage. That's all there was. 
and behind the and a tennis court and I didn't play tennis and um, so I can remember going to this pre you know the, this um, play center and all the mums that were there were either farm owners farm workers or share milkers and there is a social um, if anybody's involved in the dairying industry you understand that farm owners relate with farm owners share milkers relate with share milkers and farm workers are the bottom of the pit they just you know so nobody kind of interrelates in that zone it's like and I thought I don't even like cows <laughs> I'm none of those things <laughs> so and I've never been farming girl so I like you know where do I fit in this place I just felt so alone and uh in this place I can remember God speaking to me you know in this place of despair thinking we have so missed the plot here saying God you know I I'm struggling and he, he spoke to me and he said you know what I can do more with your husband's mistake if he's made a mistake than I can do with your rebellious heart right now Be thankful in all things. I know. Oh, you love that scripture. So, <laughs> so I then had to learn in my heart to submit to the fact that God was still in charge. I, I thank God for that shift because not only was it, that's where we went into ministry. That's where Steve was called into ministry. And what I, what I thought he was losing in Carterton, in Harwood Intermediate School, little did I know that there were two born again, full on fire, lovers of Jesus on the staff, two men, his own peers, that would get him alongside. And he ended up meeting with them every week to pray and grow in God. And I just thought what I was afraid to let go of in that season, when I thought I had it together, when I thought I knew what the purposes and the best purposes of God were, he had another season and he walked us into that so I just think um, I'm, I'm going to stop there that's enough ramble from me because it's nearly morning tea time and we need coffee um, <laughs> so here we are that's that's a part of the season of my life and that's part of the journey that we're on and God so loves you and he wants to take you where you are and understand that you know no matter what's happened for those who love God who are called in his plan all things, even what you're ashamed of in your past, he can turn that around and he can make it good today. Thank you, ladies.